ready to get serious about building content sites and building a profitable business online? Welcome to the Niche Website Builders Podcast. We bring you the latest field-tested tips, tricks, and strategies for building a profitable online asset. We interview industry experts, share customer success stories, and reveal our own experiences working on hundreds of sites to inspire and motivate you to make something happen. Let's do this. Welcome everyone to the Niche Website Builders podcast. Today we have Owen Walker. Now, in this episode, we have Owen walk through exactly how he started his online business and website and went from essentially zero all the way to uh, mid six figures and then exit on the other side. So we get a, a good look at how he managed to scale his website, um, especially in terms of his SOPs, his systems. He's a big system man and loves building systems and making things automated. So that's one that we cover there that can help you with running your business and giving back your time. And we cover a bunch of um, other bits and pieces as well around monetization, hiring, um, and anything to do with online business and entrepreneurship. So if you're looking to essentially build and scale your business to exit, this is the perfect episode for you. If you want to check out his website that he built, scaled, and sold, it's at scienceforsport.com, and then it'll also be in the description. Cheers. This episode is brought to you by Niche Website Builders, an agency dedicated to helping people just like you build profitable content sites. Niche Website Builders are the hands-off content site marketing agency you always wished existed. It's run by content site marketers for content site marketers, and they help both investors and individuals alike build profitable online properties. They provide a fully outsourced approach to content creation, link building, and done-for-you website builds, the same approach they use on their own six-figure portfolios. For example, their content packages come with a proprietary keyword research process, are written by in-house native English speakers, formatted using templates proven to convert, and uploaded to WordPress with affiliate links added so that all you need to do is hit the publish button. Check them out at nichewebsite.builders slash show. That's nichewebsite.builders slash show and fill out the form to get coupon codes for 10% more content or a 10% discount on links with your first order sent right to your inbox. Welcome to the Niche Website Builders podcast. Today we have Owen Walker. Welcome, Owen. Hi, James. How are you, mate? I'm good, man. So I've for the people listening to this podcast, if you go back a couple of podcasts and listen to Jared Krause's uh, podcast we did, I think it was a few weeks ago now, we actually gave Owen a shout out on that podcast there too. And he's the guy, Owen is the guy that Jared met at, was it at the skate park? It was at the skate park, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So that skate park story, this is the Owen from that skate park. Now, I've actually, I guess, been writing for your website's since 2017, I think it was when I first came <laughs> on board back in the day, um, near the infancy. So it's been about five years. I'm, I'm still writing. So if anyone say, I'm still actually writing for Owen's website, which he has now exited, um, but still involved with. So maybe for the listeners, do you want to maybe give a brief background about yourself and then we'll dive into the website. And if I guess if you're happy to share what the website is, you can do that too. Yeah, no problem at all. Firstly, mate, it's been an honor having you right for us for the last five years so like it's been brilliant the whole time a uh, bit of background about myself I kind of try to be a footballer that's a soccer player for Americans um, but yeah I always wanted to be a pro footballer and failed so like every sports scientist S&C coach you kind of go right okay I want to work in the field but not that I originally thought physiotherapy um, went and studied sports science during my sports science degree Realised there was no online resource for learning about sports science, a go-to place. Saw so bodybuilding.com, um, I think 21-year-old out of Idaho. I think he started it, we sold it at 21 for like 100 million. And I was like, fuck, like, this is what I should do, is build an encyclopedia for sports science and medicine and, and it'd be the go-to place. So that, that was the original vision. And yeah, that's where it came from, I suppose. Nice. Are you able to share the site or is, that, or is the site, I guess, under wraps? 
No, I can share the site. Um, scienceforsport.com. So F O R is that scienceforsport.com. Um, and then you can obviously see us on Instagram and stuff like that. The I will say as well, I think the, like in its current state, the website looks very simplistic for a better word, <laughs> but a bit average and stuff like that. But obviously, <laughs> everything that goes in the, the additional digital assets like the podcast, the Instagram, the email list, um, the following and the user base monthly recurring revenue is everything that kind of bolsters up that, that valuation and stuff um so yeah check it out if you yeah. if you fancy it yeah for sure yeah if anyone's yeah yeah why listen to this check out scienceforsport.com but i guess for anyone listening who kind of wants to get an idea of where the site fits in the space it would be like do you have your typical, as you mentioned, bodybuilding.com, teenage.com as your general fitness magazine sites for like the general population? Science of Sport is probably one of the most or more well-known, I guess, sports science brands that's more targeted towards, I guess, strength conditioning coaches and, uh, I guess, professional sport professionals, essentially. Um, but it does also have some carryover into that general fitness area as well, but more geared towards that coaching side, so a little higher level information on there but maybe for the listeners do you want to maybe touch on how you got this started you mentioned obviously you came across some 20 on 21 year old selling bodybuilding.com for a stupid amount of money so obviously you saw that what was your next step to get this thing started um so i, I probably kind of realized that and saw that i think it was 2012 um maybe a little bit before 2010, 2011, when I kind of saw bodybuilding.com and thought maybe I should do something myself. Um, at the time, I was in my f- first or second year of studying at university. I did four years total, so undergraduate degree, master's degree. Um, and I actually did nothing really with it until after university. So finished university 2014, or 20, yeah, 2014, I got a job working for a a professional football club as a sports scientist um, and I did that kind of for like a year and then I decided that actually I wanted to go country shopping and I moved to California then I moved to Australia and during that transition as well I thought okay well I'm resigning from my position at the club and I've always wanted to build science for sport so why don't I set about building it um, and then move my income source online so that I can live and work from wherever I want to in the world and still work in the in the realms of sports science, which I kind of trained in and I wanted to do. So we're looking at sort of 2015 now when um, I started to get wheels turning. I had no idea what I was doing about business, just for the record for everyone. Um, I, I actually launched the website. Um, I, mean, I didn't know what I was going to sell. I just launched the website for if I get traffic, then eventually I can come up with an idea on how I can monetize it. So I was building away behind closed doors. I wrote about 40 articles, like blog post type things, um, so that I could drip feed the website, put initial like bulk on the website when I launched and then drip feed it and then keep up. So I had a backlog of content. Um, and this was April 2016 was when I launched the website. Um, without a product. December 2016 is when I introduced the product and managed to monetize it. Gotcha. I think on one of our first calls, this must have been 2017 now, you mentioned about uh, you grew an Instagram page and that was part of the reason for the growth in traffic? Yeah, so I tried to... One thing about me, my my best strength is also my best weakness. I'm, I'm extremely analytical about everything. So I like, something happens, I'd scratch away at it, scratch at the surface and think, what's the best way to do this? What's the best way to do that? Best way to do that. So before I launched the website, I launched a Facebook page. This is when Facebook was killing it in terms of organic traffic. Um, Instagram was really nothing to be used at the time, which makes me sound like an absolute dinosaur. (laughs) But um, so Instagram (laughs) wasn't really a, a place for traffic and stuff it was all Facebook and so I started a Facebook page and started sending it's built a bit of a following and an audience on Facebook then launched a website and so when I say I reverse engineered it sorry I come back I had a a bigger vision of opening a lot of sports performance centers 
So those are like high performance fitness centers, gyms, purely for athletes, basically. That was the vision. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. But I thought if I open one of those and I do the big unveil, cut the rope, everybody comes in or cut the ribbon, like nobody's going to turn up if I haven't got an audience. So I thought, okay, well, I could start a website and build an audience so that when I open the facilities, um, people know about us and come in. And I thought, okay, before I start a website, why not start a Facebook page? And that's what I mean about scratching scratching the surface and thinking, how can I reverse mm. this engineer to to get the minimal risk possible? Because a large risk, if you open a facility, is going to cost you tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, or pounds, depending on where you are, or whatever. But um, so I thought a website's low cost, and then Facebook, again, is even more low cost. So I reverse engineered that way. Built the audience built the website and then went from there. Yeah, smart. Just taking action, building traffic and then essentially going from there. Otherwise people get too stuck in analysis paralysis trying to figure out, you know, what the grand plan is. But you probably dodged a bullet. Uh not opening those facilities because COVID <laughs> rolled around and obviously I guess as well, gyms aren't exactly profitable things. They are not no and so I that's something I come to learn if it's funny, hindsight is twenty twenty, um, and that's part of the reason I wanted to exit it, so I'd learn a lot of lessons. Did I need to exit it to learn those lessons? Who knows, but I learned lessons now. Eventually, if I look at the grand scheme, if I had, if you gave me back the business now and I had it, a full realm, I would still open those facilities as part of a long-term strategy. Um, I'd build a group structure company mm -hmm. and the facilities, the actual property and real estate and stuff, those assets would be, you know, a separate subsidiary and then mm. yeah go there but it, when you add the physical to the digital you substantiate your authority in the market so you know what i mean you're recording content in your facilities you've got that. athletes in your facilities that that just shows so much in terms of authority in, in the market uh, if you stay purely digital which is what oh, i oh, did you got a oh. sorry yeah you just got to leverage other people's stuff which, no, can, you go. which can be difficult Yeah, I, I want to actually dive a little bit later into that, into what you would do if you hadn't sold the website. But I want to come back to you mentioned, obviously, how analytical you are. And I guess I've seen this as well in your SOPs. And your SOPs are damn good. Like at the time, obviously, when I first started, before I had done all this, I, I, never know, I didn't even know there were SOPs. They were just guides for me to to help <laughs> but obviously that sop has been <laughs> been revised about three or four times now into i guess into something now where someone can come in and pretty much just write a research review or whatever it is just from the sop so maybe that's time because myself for my own businesses i i don't think i have any sops and it's something that i definitely need to start developing how would you advise someone to start developing their own sops is there a, a method or something that you do to make it easier the quick answer is just do it as a step-by-step -step process in a google document which is similar to the sop that mm -hmm. obviously i gave you when you onboarded onto to writing for us mm -hmm. um that's a short answer the to give a little bit of information in between short answer and sort of longer answer is if you haven't systemized your business i.e if you couldn't go sit in the beach in the middle of Indonesia, not turn your laptop on, not answer a phone call, not reply to anyone for six months, what would your business do? Would your business decline? Would it stay flat or would it go up? Now, if it doesn't at least maintain, definitely if it doesn't go up, you don't have a business. You have a job. Right, and the cash flow quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki, for anyone who's read it, will explain part of this. You, you've got an E, an I, a B, and a, uh, sorry, an E, an S, a B, and an I. And those four things refer to an employee, self-employed, um, business owner, or investor. Now, the, the goal when you're building a business is to move through those quadrants. But effectively, like, you can be an employee, work for someone. You can be self-employed where you've got your business and if you don't switch your laptop on, it will decline. That's a job. That's what you've got. You're just self-employed. A business is where your business will maintain or go up without your um, input whatsoever. 
that's when you know you fully, the, and the message I'm trying to get to that is that's when you know you fully systemized everything that you've got going on. Um, and for the most part with what I did, I, I, I managed to do that, at least kept it at a maintenance, but I could go away for two weeks and it's still, on it was still sort of growing, do you know what I mean? But I was still mm. the real driver behind it and I had to make a decision. Do I employ someone to be the, the driver behind it because I want to step back or do I get hungry and go for it and stuff like that? Um, so the key message there is if your business can't maintain or grow without you, you've got a job. And if that's the case, you need to build good systems. Now, I love systems. Like, I just genuinely do. I'm, I'm good <laughs> at it. I realize that's just how I operate. Um, and what, like, there's a, there's a movie called Founder, which is about um, uh, Ray Kroc, the founder of the McDonald's Corporation. So obviously, if anyone who's watching it, I guess most people listen to this are entrepreneurs in some way. If you haven't watched it, go watch it because it will sort of throw a bit of fuel on your fire. You had McDonald's, those were the original creators, and then you had Ray Kroc, who, um, McDonald's Corporation, and it, it's, it's a fun story. But he built, um, well, they built an unbelievable system, and he took that system and scaled it. Now, if you walk into it, I love this, like because if you walk into any McDonald's around the world, all over the world, one, the consistency is unbelievable. They have certain brand promises um, that they keep to, and the consistency is one of them. It's phenomenal. And the best bit about McDonald's is their SOPs, their systems are that good that the entire place is run by teenagers or people with learning disabilities. Like, that's how good their systems are. And why do they do that as well? Because they get subsidies for, for employing those people. They get low cost labor. Like labor is the most expensive output of any business. Now McDonald's have gone. How how can we get super cheap labor? And they've just they've absolutely nailed it. I love it. And now you when you walk into McDonald's, they don't even you don't even order with someone anymore. They inter, they yeah you got a screen now. They're the forefront runners on the screens. They are killing it. And soon they'll they'll remove a lot of the people in there. And it will be probably just have a manager in there and that'll be it. The rest of the thing will be like um, those little hoovers that walk about on the floor and whatever, do you know what I mean? Like it, <laughs> it's, they're just eliminating that overhead so well because their systems are that good. It's, it's yeah, it's brilliant. So mm. oh, I got a bit amped up on systems there, but yeah, like you have to build good systems. Yeah, good. And, and my tip to anyone when it comes to building systems, is just do it on a Google doc and go step by step, say, right, okay, I need somebody to create infographics. Okay, first thing to do is look at this one I've created and just put that infographic on the Google document. This is what I've created. I want them to look similar to this. And we did this. I had an infographic creator, right? Then log into canva.com. Depends where you create. You might create them in Adobe, Photoshop, whatever, but go canva.com. This is the template. You've already saved the template. It's got your font, your colors, your logo, all that stuff on there. Now, all you need to do is put the information on there. If you've got an infographic creator, then it depends how you do it. But the infographic creator we use was a sports scientist that understood the industry. And then all they had to do was come up with stuff like this. That then comes into do direct them with the content that you want. The answer should be yes. But you can give them free reign in the early days and just say, yeah, this is what we want. Log into Canva, use this template. Um stick to this font, these colors, blah, 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 put this, do this, do this, do this. Easy. Send it to them via email. And the reason you use Google Docs is live. You can always update it. They can update it. And then what you should do is the best person to update those systems is the user, is the operator, right? The user of those operations, which is that person. It's the infographic creator. If you try and update it like a year down the line, Canva might have made a few changes to how this works and how that works. And you're just not the best person for it. They use it every single day. They're the best person for it. So make them update it and pay them to update it. Take them two hours, pay them $25 an hour, whatever you're paying them, cost you $50, and they're maintaining and improving the system that you've built and you just sit back and drink tea. So I don't know. So. <laughs> I do love systems, I guess. if you didn't get that picture. I get yeah, I guess if you're from the UK, then you sit back and drink tea, but I'll, I'll pass on that, on that tea. But just then, so you're building, yeah, <laughs> if you're building the systems, how did you know when it was time to start hiring for these systems? Obviously, 
the website and things have to make enough money for you to feel comfortable enough. So the website needs to co cover your basic expenses. You moved overseas. You don't have the income from the job anymore. So when do, when do you, I guess, when do you see it viable to start outsourcing that, that stuff with your systems? There's two versions to that. The first is day one and you pull money from somewhere your own pocket, you get a loan, get investors, still a loan. But ideally, I say ideally, there's no right or wrong. Um, but day one, you could do that. You just need cash in order to do it. If you don't have cash and you're a bit of a wuss and you're not willing to take that risk, well, then you're, you're going to have to do it yourself and graft away and hustle away and do that stuff to get it to get that business cash flowing so that then you can go, okay, right, I've got X amount of budget here. What should I hire someone for? Should I hire someone to create infographics? Should I hire someone to create mm -hmm. content? Should I hire, well, same thing, but like articles, should I hire someone to run the email marketing? Should I hire someone to deal with customer support? That's your decision as the founder of the company to decide where you need to allocate resources. Um, so those are your two options. You either do it um, from day one using cash in your back pocket or from a loan, or you do it and run it a loss, which is using a loan from the bank. But Or second option is get it cash flowing and do it yourself until that point. But one thing you should do, and, and again, I, I love all these. I built a system for it because I profit, um, <laughs> is a task audit. So doing a task audit sort of monthly um, to find out where you're spending your time. So you write down like emails, um, like customer support emails, email marketing, Facebook ads, content creation, managing the team, continual learning. And then you write those things down, everything you do per week. And then you write your time cost of doing that, right? I spend five hours doing this, two hours doing this, blah, 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 blah. Is that an operational task or a growth task? And then you identify, okay, if I'm answering customer support emails, that's an operational task. A growth task is writing marketing emails. So there's a difference. You decide which is which, and then you go, okay, right, I'm spending five hours a week doing customer support emails. That task needs to be outsourced. I need to write a system Hire someone from Upwork, wherever, um, or within your own network. Hire that person. Get it off your task so that you can move. There's a good analogy I like to use. Um, if you've got an open motorway, freeway, highway, whatever, and you're in your car, if there's no other cars on the road, you can go as fast as you possibly want and as fast as you possibly can. Forget about the laws, right? <laughs> you can go as fast as you possibly can. Um, <laughs> The more cars that are on that road, the more congestion, the more traffic it slows you down. So your um, objective as the founder and entrepreneur, your business is to move as fast as humanly possible. So you need to keep those cars off the road. In other words, you need to keep those shit daily operational tasks out of your way so you can just go as fast as you can. Mm. Nice. So then if you if you mentioned things like Facebook ads, email marketing, you know, anything like that. If you don't have experience doing that, for example, maybe you're looking to do Facebook ads, but you haven't done it. Would Are you still writing systems for that, for the person you hire, or are you looking to hire maybe an expert in that area who will create the system for you? Two-part answer. To the second question, the answer is yes. But before you do that, in my opinion, you need to understand it. So... Yeah. In my opinion, there's six pillars to business. I always forget one of them, but I'll try and read them off. You got product, <laughs> marketing, sales, finances, operations, and team. Those are the six pillars to the business. Everything falls within those six categories, right? Um, and so as an entrepreneur or founder, business manager, operator, whatever it is, in my opinion, you need to have a fundamental understanding of each of those. Because if you don't, if you understand five of them, but you don't understand marketing and you go to an SEO company or a Facebook company, Facebook ads company, whatever, 
nine times out of ten they're going to have your pants down. So, yeah. it, and they do all the time. I've used several different SEO agencies, several different Facebook ads. And I'll say before I set KPIs for them, I, they'd give me KPI. Well, they'd say, "Yeah, we're going to try and do this. We're going to try and do that." And then I'd just be throwing money at them, and we weren't scaling. We weren't getting big results. When you understand it yourself, you can set the KPIs and the benchmarks for them. And if they don't deliver, you fire them, you get rid of them. But you're only going to know if you're being taken for a ride or you got your pants down or whatever if you understand a fundamental basis of those six pillars. So to answer your question again, mm -hmm. yes, I would outsource the Facebook ads, but I'd understand it first and give them exactly what KPIs you want them to hit. And if they don't deliver, you decide. You sack them, do you keep them? By understanding them, you mean you might have to lose a little bit of money doing it yourself a bit just so you can get a handle of how it works and what kind of results you're looking to see? Exactly. The, I've read a lot of books and watched a lot of videos and done all this stuff. A lot of it falls out of your head. You forget it. You only remember, like, my interpretation really is you only really remember things and remember things well when you feel the pain. You have to feel the pain to remember it, to want to avoid it in the future. So if you go run, I wouldn't just say start running Facebook ads and spend $1,000 a day. I wouldn't say that. You can do that, but it's going to be a costly way. I would say... That's too much pain. Yeah, <laughs> far too much pain. So especially if you're a, um, an early stage startup. So yeah, way too much. And I, I would, yeah, I would find the experts in the space. I'd read their blog. I'd watch their videos. I'd get a fundamental understanding. I'd flick around the Facebook ads. I'd speak to someone who's an expert, jump on the phone, pay them $200 to sit down with you for an hour, whatever their cost is, and just give you some heads up because that will save you more money when you start trying it. And then once I run by the 70% rule, when you're 70% comfortable, you understand it enough, then move on. That's great, right? 70% is perfect. That for me, 70% is perfect. Because if you delay and try and get 90%, 100%, perfection is the enemy of progress. So you're just wasting your time trying to get the little bits right and trying to do this, like, Fuck that, forget about it. Just get 70% happy with it. That's perfect. And go. So when you're 70% happy, you understand Facebook ads, run ads. Run ads, get it wrong, feel the pain, you learn the lesson, reflect on what happened, try it again. Didn't work, feel the pain, reflect on it, go again. Okay, goes again. You've got it. You've, you, something's working. Your CPA is low, your cash flow in, your you might be self-liquidating, which means you're making more money than you're spending. Um, perfect. Right. Now find a good agency, hire them, give them the money. This is what I want. Yeah. Nice. I want to dive into some, some of your hiring process then. Obviously, not so much the outsourcing to, say, agencies and ads, more the team that you built. For example, hiring myself, um, I guess the, the current team that's there now, and then obviously the members that have been through previously that have come and gone i guess how did you how did you build your hiring process where essentially you had very low i guess you had very low turnover in terms of uh writers for for the product um that we'll dive into in a little bit um and you also yeah you retain them well and you seem to bring in uh, experts relatively easily so how did you end up doing that yeah, good. Again, I've got systems. And when you say about turnover, I actually call it team lifetime period. So I'm just pulling it up now. Um, so you might understand customer lifetime period, which is how long does a customer stay with your business? Well, I replied it to your team as well. Team lifetime period. So how long does a member of staff stay with us? And I can see where's James DeLacy. I'm looking at it now. You joined... In August 2017. I think, one, I think I'm the longest. Uh, oh, yeah, I think you might. Oh, no, Francisco Tavares. He joined December 2016. He's the oh. OG, but he's left. He's gone. Yeah, but he, yeah, but he, yeah, he left. <laughs> but um, 
you've outpaced him. So what I'm looking at now is I know you joined in August 2017. I know Francisco joined in December 16. So in terms of months, you've been with us for 59 months, right? So, and you don't know I've got this stuff, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just going to run some quick, quick maths. I want to know that. What's that? Uh, 59 divided by 12. You've been with us now for 4.9 years. It's pretty cool. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, da, 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 just just because I love it. Um, so yeah, how do, how do we go about hiring? Um, the, you've got to look within. I have particular ways of doing it. I built an audience first, right? Um, and then once I had the audience and people looked to science for sport as an authority in the industry or just as a place in the industry, what people want to do, and it's slightly different for each industry, what people in, in the industry want to do, sports scientists, is they want to build a personal profile, right? They want to get out there. They, they want to put their name out there so that they get called up for conferences. They can put on their LinkedIn that they work for this company for this long, doing this job. It's better for their CV, their resume, um, and stuff like that. So the, the, it, it's a win for them because they get to build the profile, substantiate their resume and CV. Um, it's a win for us because we bring in talent that we can use to produce content. And, and it's a win for the customer because they get to consume high-quality content from industry experts, right? So it's a win, win, win. Um, so what I did is I had a system for it. Once I built a... a the website and had an audience on Facebook, on Instagram, blah, blah. I had a page on the website that said join our team. And it was in the footer of the website. So you could click it, it would pull up a new page and it say, do you want to join our team? These are the benefits. Build your profile. We, we've got an audience of half a million people, blah, blah. Um, get paid, work remotely. I can't remember what they all were, but uh, so we listed all the benefits. So it's attractive. People would hit the page, go, oh, yeah, this looks brilliant. I'll work for these guys. Bam, bam, bam. And then we had an a autofill thing. So name, email address, uh, highest level qualification, whether you've got an undergrad, master's, PhD, whatever. Write a 250-word explainer why you want to join us. Upload your resume. Upload your cover letter. They'd come through. I'd have someone on the other side who's vetting, going through, okay, this guy's got a PhD, blah, 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 he works at this club. Yeah, brilliant, stick him in the yes pile. This person's a fisherman and he dropped out in school and he just wants to earn money online, probably stick him in the no pile. <laughs> and it's just, and that's no disrespect to fishermen <laughs> or whatever, it's just you, you, you're not an industry expert in sports science, right? So they don't take that the wrong way. Um, and so we had someone vet them and then we'd have a folder of all these resumes and a list, a Google sheet of people. Okay, James DeLacy, Texas, USA, master's degree, uh, works at this place. This is LinkedIn. And it, it was just a document of all these people who wanted to join the team. And so that's how we start accumulating, accumulating a list of people who wanted to join. And then the more people we get want to join, you pick the cream of the crop, you ask them who they know who are good, build, 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 and go from there. That's how I got involved with Science of Sport is through Tim, who was writing the section. He was leaving, and then I think he referred me through to you. Okay, yeah. Well, see, I forgot about that. Yeah, so that's just it. People who are in the industry, and well, just in the industry, whatever industry you're in, if you're in um painting or music or sports science or lawn mowing you know who the good people are and the good people hang out with the good people want to hang out with the good people so you just ask them for referrals and stuff like that Hmm. i think it's interesting as well like i don't know if it's unique to sports science strength conditioning in terms of the niche but strength conditioning coaches are so used to giving or giving for free that it's becomes almost i guess you could say easier to bring them bring talent on board to write or whatever it's for your site because it's like pay payments like not really expected compared to say i don't know making money online or something yeah and to a degree i agree with that um 
I think one thing I've started to notice is industries are very similar, but everybody thinks that every every industry is unique, sure. But all, most industries are similar. And then again, most people in their industry think that mm. this is just problems of our industry. So I was deeply, both of us were deeply involved in sports science and strength and conditioning. And we know that. Um, and everybody was complaining about the same thing, yeah. no jobs, low pay, blah, 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 job competition, all this stuff, right? Um, I got invest in property and I see property education companies. We were a sports science education company, still are, um, property education companies. They've, they've got people who want to build their profile of being a property investor. Um, and they want to build their audience as being a property investor and teaching people. And I got sent for an Excel spreadsheet yesterday from a property investment company, like a buying agent who are trying to educate to build their audience as content marketing, right? They're doing it as content marketing. And I looked at the spreadsheet. I was like, this just looks like a shit one that most, most people in sports science would produce. I was like, There's, th- these industries are absolutely mirrored. Like, they're so reflective. Um, and so everybody gets bogged down and I got bogged down, which was part of the reason for the exit in the, the problems inside a niche and forget about the upside. And you get so immersed in the problems that yeah, you get blind to the upside to it and, and realize that most industries are all the same. Um, so that's off tangent, but yeah, something I realized. Yeah. I mean, I see the same job complaints on SEO Twitter as well like you? Pay, you know shit hours all that stuff so i mean it's yeah i see it's i see the same stuff I'm like okay so and it's the same things like different people within this industry having beef with other people and whatever else and you're like yeah okay so everything's everything's the same <laughs> it doesn't matter which industry or profession you move into they've all got the same same problems yeah exactly so there you go everybody's a victim everybody's got the same problems like most everybody like this is the thing <laughs> this is just a dig at society i suppose but everybody's a victim when it comes to like economics and their personal finances but nobody how many people do you know go away and learn about how to save money how to invest money how to earn more money fucking five percent of the population ten percent of the population probably do the rest don't and then the rest complain about it so i like, won't well, go away and educate yourself and if you're not going to be willing to educate yourself on at least the fundamentals of like managing money, saving money, blah, blah, blah. Don't complain about it. But I know that can be a sore topic because obviously people are struggling and things like that, which I completely understand. But at least take some ownership to try and learn some fundamentals of it. But yeah, um, there you go. That is off on a tangent. That's that's what... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's what uh, I guess most people listening to this are doing as well anyway, since they're trying to build their own own websites and educating themselves here which is great but i actually wanted to talk about how so you hired hired staff you have the traffic now and then you look to launch your first product and maybe you want to dive into what that product was how you how you came up with this being the right fit as the first product and then i guess why you chose a subscription model over selling say uh one off whatever it was like say training programs Okay, there's three questions there, weren't there? Gonna have to try and remember them. Um, the f- the first one was was what? Sorry, what, what it was to start with? <laughs> what it was? Um, a monthly so what, magazine. What, what, the, what the product was? Yeah. Okay. In in simple terms, it's a monthly magazine. To expand uh, to expand on that, it was a digital only magazine because, like most people here, they understand online, right? I couldn't be asked with logistics of dealing with physical products. I can't be asked with someone calling our customer support centers and email say, oh, the postman didn't deliver it this Saturday morning when I spoke, when I was in, he said it's at the post office, got to pick it up, my dog's sick. Like, I don't care about that. Like, I just want the quickest, most efficient <laughs> delivery of your product without the headache. You're happy, I'm happy, everything like that. So most people listening to this, obviously, like digital businesses, right? So they understand that already. So that was... First and foremost, why I did it as a digital business, um, as a digital product. It was a monthly magazine, and that magazine was a summary of the latest sports science research. So, for instance, James hosted his podcast. He's a gun. He absolutely knows sports science, strength and conditioning like the back of his hand. 
He's a very smart bloke. Um, he knows he's got undergrad degree, master's degree, if I'm right, your master's degree, um, if I remember. And he knows how to read and interpret sports science research. Every single month, new research is published saying that ice baths only work at 10 degrees water temperature Celsius um, if you use for more than eight minutes or something like that, right? Or it says that foam rolling doesn't work if you just do it for 10 seconds. You need to spend 60, 90 seconds doing it on one muscle, something like that, right? So you get an understanding of this research and what James would do in our research review, as we call them, is they would read the latest research, would have a list of different research, consolidate it, say, right, these are the ones, these are the top 10 we want to send to our audience this month because they're the most important for our readers summarize them into a little one pager like this is what the research did this is what the study did this is the practical applications and this is the reviewers comments we put that into a pdf document and we sent it out every single month so there's a monthly magazine of the latest research uh what was the second question sorry how did you come up with this as the viable product did you have anything else in mind or was this just like what what made you think that this would be the right fit Mm. yeah good question um i questioned myself on that (laughs) afterwards um it was funny (laughs) i i wanted to do a membership model for the subscription which is your third question right so i had the sticky revenue Mm -hmm. um recurring revenue so i wanted to build a membership platform and so what i did was i created a list of features or benefits of that membership so research reviews video courses um articles tools like google sheets and spreadsheets that coaches could use to record athlete data and all this stuff and i just thought how much of this stuff can i pack into this monthly membership to pad it out to make it of x value um and I looked at it all and, got, and this was right back, obviously, I had no idea about business until 2016. Um, and I thought, ah, that's a lot of work for me to do. I can't produce all that per month. Maybe what I could do is I could do a research review um, magazine. That would be the simplest. That could be the first thing I do, and then I add other bits to it as time goes on. So I just thought, okay, it's the simplest, cheapest, quickest sort of thing I can do. Let's do that. And then we can put one out every month. And that's the thing is you've got fresh content every single month. So it means you can have repeat customers, which is what I wanted. I wanted reoccurring revenue. Um, So I looked at that membership model, but I I didn't want to be chasing customers every single month. And this is the problem with like drop shipping companies, in my my opinion anyway, like just as a business owner, it's not a problem in terms of unit economics and making money, but it's just the headache of chasing new customers every single month and getting one-off purchases and stuff. Like, I just couldn't be bothered with that. So I want a subscription model. As a side note, I heard something recent, like maybe about a year ago, that I thought was quite interesting, and I don't know the validity, the validity of it, but apparently it's moved in cycles. So maybe 70s, 80s, subscription was a big, was a big thing, and people had subscriptions for a lot of things. I could be wrong, could be completely wrong. I don't know. I can't remember where I heard it, but... And then people got fed up of having so many subscriptions that people moved to a one-time payment option. And then people gravitated towards that. And now we've gone full circle where everything was one-time payment. And now people got, and then companies go, oh, let's do subscription. There's a, there's a reduction. So now it's going like this. So now we might be seeing that the swings move back to more subscription. Then eventually they go, actually, let's go back to one-time payment. And we just do that through the decades. That might be the way it happens. Who knows? But um yeah, that is a side note. But right now, the getting's good with subscription and, and recurring revenue. And that adds value to the business, which I'm sure everybody here understands as well, you know, in terms of valuations and access. Do, do you want to maybe touch on some very general, I guess, revenue and maybe traffic figures as you kind of went through from starting, I guess, this product? And then it doesn't have to be where it is now because I know you sold it and it might be some legal stuff, but maybe to, I don't know, before you, sometime before you sold it? Yeah, so um, I was, so I basically started the website in 2016, launched the website and the product, and I sold it 
four years later, 2020, three years, 11 months. Um, in that time frame, um, first, first year we did, uh, is about, I don't know, say 30, even between 30 and 50,000 pounds, which is about 50, 70,000 us dollars in revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, the growth was linear. So we went up to about 175,000 pounds to 250,000 to eventually 330,000. Um, so that, that was the growth. Obviously that's how much you kind of put in, that was recurring revenue basically. Um, because we just had that subscription product. So that, yeah, that's the evolution of revenues. Um, Traffic at exit, we had about 85,000 unique visits a month uh, from memory. So over that span, obviously it's incremental and it's variable. So um, we probably generated in the range of 2 million, I don't know, a couple of million total hits, total unique visits over that four-year period at the time of exit. So in terms of you deciding to exit what what were the reasons or signs for you to look to sell the business and then did you have to do obviously you had your systems in place you probably didn't have to do much but was there anything that you had to do uh extra to be ready to sell um so two questions there is kind of why i wanted to sell is that right and then the second one is what did i have to do to get ready to yeah. sell first yeah. question um it was risk tolerance for me i uh, in order to grow and take it to the next level i felt like i had to put a lot of money back into it like i needed to get a new website that meant either paying a, out like an agency to do it externally it was cost i don't know probably upwards of thirty thousand pounds fifty thousand dollars do you know what i mean into the six figures like it's expensive to get a full custom site and then what happens is you're at the mercy of those developers so if they turn around if they get an issue you say i need this fix they go oh we're really busy i mean i can't do it for two weeks you're like well my website's down the customers can't get access i need you to fix it now they say oh, okay we can do it but it's going to cost you twice as much something like that right like you're at their mercy yeah so i was scared of that um which meant maybe I'll hire an internal developer. But at the same time, developers don't like using other people's code. It's just like a, an IP type thing and they can make more money by saying, I don't want to touch that code, so pay for my code. Developers just hot property, right? And find a good one and <laughs> stuff like that. So we're always at their mercy. So I didn't have the risk tolerance to plow all the money back in. I didn't have a, my net worth wasn't bad, but it wasn't at a point where I was comfortable and maybe losing it all. I was just fearful, right? It's like I was genuinely just fearful. Um, And so I didn't have the risk tolerance to grow it from a cash perspective, personal finance perspective, whatever. I could have reinvested all the money it was making back in, but I wanted to sort of build my wealth and and go about that. I was still putting X amount back into it. Um, So that that was a, a large reason for the sale. I'd also got bogged down in industry, like just oh, like, back and forth, do you know what I mean? Like competitors doing this and doing that. Like there's a bit of that. I just yeah. kind of got fed up about the industry and thought, oh, and I lost sight of it. I saw this big thing, this bodybuilding.com, $100 million exit, sports science, how big it could be, the, the global encyclopedia, mm-hmm. sports science encyclopedia and sports medicine. And as I built, I got more and more tunnel vision because to target everyone is to target no one. It's a good saying I like. If you try and target nutritionists, strength and conditioning coaches, sports tech guys um sport coaches everything then you need to produce so much content so fast to keep all those people engaged that you end up targeting no one so i got very specific and as you know we went hard basically just in on strength and conditioning um and i i just saw that tunnel vision lost sight of the global picture of how big it could be and just looked at oh this is just a strength and conditioning site um so yeah risk tolerance industry bogged down um and and that was it and i also um when it comes to selling it in terms of preparation like 
I didn't necessarily want to say I listed it as a win-win scenario. So if I listed it and nobody wanted to buy it, I figured out I got to learn why they didn't want to buy it, where the holes were, which meant a stronger business for me because I was going to plug those holes. So I just had people in real time telling me, no, I don't want this business for X, Y, Z. And I go, okay, thanks for that heads up. Right, off I go. I want to build a more profitable business then or like I'm going to plug these holes. I'm going to get more traffic sources or I'm going to make sure the revenue's stickier or anything like that, right? So, or it needs a bigger Instagram page or more engagement on Instagram. Whatever it was, I went away and fixed that. So I had a, a juicier, juicier beast to, um, and just self-learning. And the other win, so that was one of the wins. The other win was if someone comes along and they want to pay a price I'm willing to sell it for, then happy days, right? And by doing that, I de-risk myself personally. Yeah. So I'm confident that I know enough about content businesses that, I can build another one and, and do the exact same thing, and but this time not exit and build it into a monster until maybe I want to exit for a lot more money. Um, so it was about, I didn't have the risk to grow it, um, bogged down in the industry. I did it as a win-win, so I wanted to see where the holes were. With the, I listed it so I could find out, I listed it. Um, yeah, so I could find out where the issues were and I could plug them. If somebody wanted to buy it for a price that was willing to sell it, brilliant and it de-risk myself if i did sell it so that financially i feel more comfortable and i can take more risk on the next business um because i am not so fearful so it was about really getting rid of that personal fear that i had do you know what i mean mm. i i think as website builders we all live in that fear of big g tanking our sites anyways <laughs> so <laughs> So I'm sure it's felt by everyone listening to this. <laughs> That's also why um, buyers want to see that you've got multiple marketing channels for stability or that's a that's a plus to look at or it's also a negative for them to look at because they look at it and go, oh, okay, well, he's already got all of these, can't, these marketing channels. I can't add much more to it. Whereas if you've just got Google and there's no Instagram, there's no YouTube, no email, then they go, he's missing a trick here. I'm going to add these on. So it's, it's two sides of the same coin when it comes to selling a site. Buyers either see the opportunity or they see the strength, but they do see both. In hindsight, would you have sold when you sold? And I guess if not, or, or even if you were, how would you, how would you look to scale the site if you hadn't sold it? Um, yeah, hindsight's a wonderful thing. It's... It's a funny one. I, it's something I kind of, I at least think about weekly, maybe even, uh, not daily, but I definitely think about it weekly. Would I have sold it? I don't think I should have sold it. No. And some much wealthier and very smarter people, like a decker and a hectare millionaire. So tens of millions, hundreds of millions told me not to sell it at the time. Um, so yeah, obviously listen to their advice or whatever, but the same thing, at the same time, I wouldn't have necessarily have learned the lessons have now if i didn't sell it so i and, and this is what i've got to realize is a good story and it's in the film social network about facebook mark zuckerberg um i can't remember all the details of it but it's a cool story mm. whatever they're sitting they're in a bar and he says they're talking about the the founder of victoria's secret he sold out for something like 10 million three years later they the acquiring company sold it for like 300 million and he threw himself off the golden gate bridge now I don't know the exact details of that story. I don't, hopefully nobody's listening who's related or anything. I've got the story wrong, but it's pretty much along that. If you want to hear the story, watch a social network. So the, the reason I tell that story is like, it, I can't let myself live in the past of, I shouldn't have sold it because this is what it could be. And if it gets sold for multiple millions, like tens of millions, hundreds of millions or whatever, later down the line, yeah. I've just got to look at it that I did what I could and I saw this big vision and my vision was correct and take the benefits from it, right? Um, so no, I don't regret selling. If I, I think selling was the right thing for me to do, but not the right thing to do. Um, where could it go now is I, – don't want to say too much because obviously the acquiring company, I still work with them. I'm, I've been on a two-year key man locking contract 
So like mm-hmm. stay with a company. It was a six month clause. I didn't I could leave after six months, but I've enjoyed it. And things are really progressing and moving forward now and it looks like we're gonna extend and stuff like that. So I don't want to give too much away because we're building the grand vision and it's it's developing now. Um but it's to build out my original plan, you know, like things are gonna be an absolute beast. So yeah, that's kind of where it's going now. And I'm excited about where it's going. You know, it's fun to be part of it and, and kind of play out my vision um, to, a, to a degree. Do you know what I mean? And see it come to life at least. So. Mm. Yeah. And I think that the fact that you've gone through the whole process now, building to selling, and as you mentioned, now you, you believe like, it doesn't matter you know, what kind of content business it is, you can replicate that, but take it to even bigger heights because you've now gone through the whole process and you understand from beginning to the end. Exactly. Yeah. And that was another reason for selling. So I wanted to understand the exit process because when you build a business, you should build it with the exit in mind. So I, I it's funny. I see a lot. I, depends what you want. I see a lot of companies, a lot of online companies, and it just be some sort of Amazon FBA or drop shipping or like just, I don't know, I think a lot of NAF companies, they might be good in terms of cash flow and stuff like that, but I would rather focus on building one really good company that solves an industry problem and, and provides all that than just doing some sort of drop shipping cash flow business. Like, but that's just me personally. It's not saying there's anything wrong with doing that. Um, so I wanted to go through that exit process so I learned all the benefits of s- selling a business or how it all works in terms of selling um, so that next time from the get-go, I'm going to build with the exit in mind and I can build a monster that I either keep for cash flow or I exit or exit X amount of shares. If there's 100 shares in the company, I might end up selling 10, 20, 30, 50, 80, whatever it is, percentage of those shares and retain X amount and still keep cash flow. Um, so, mm. yeah, like I, I think it's, it's a very good lesson to learn um, is how to sell how to sell a business. But yeah, like I said, that's three phases. I would say build, scale, sell, um, scale it to X amount, and yeah, the, the next challenge is to scale a company seven, eight, nine figures. If I want to go to nine figures, eight figures would be cool. But I think to get to nine figures, you've got to be a completely different beast. And um, and that means normally just dedicating your entire life to that project. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not sure if that's – like I want to dedicate my life to it, but I also want to enjoy my life. I think there's a, there's a – you've got to find a good medium between enjoying your life and doing that. There's Sir Alex Ferguson, the greatest sort of football manager of all time, in my opinion, my second maybe – Guardiola, he's the manager of Manchester United Football Club, and like you watch, you watch his bio story, and he like he literally just all in, dedicated his entire life, and you see this with like other founders, entrepreneurs, and he didn't see his kids growing up. All he did was work, like he barely spent time with his kids, you know. And for me personally, I I think there's lessons to be learned in that from both. You need to do that to be really successful but you need to not do that if you want to enjoy your time have time with your kids and your family because if if let's face it we're all just humans we're just bags of cells you know what I mean floating around like you might get ill you might get terminally ill in the next couple of years or anything like that it's just reality of life so you want to make sure you have a good life and so um, yeah my, my motto my kind of life thing to it is do something worth doing build it big build it with the exit of mind but make sure you maintain your own personal life and enjoyment nice that's a good message for everyone listening that's actually a good little good little spot to end on i know i guess people might want to follow what you're doing now but i know no one could follow you because you're like a recluse now you're like the entrepreneur that exited then just went to the woods and has gone off the grid so <laughs> no one can actually follow what you're doing and i think you told me your your working rule now is what three hours a week or something like that so you can just go surfing yeah, it's not quite three hours, a bit more, but yeah, I I just surf. I surf the majority of the time. Um, um, skate with Sam at Jared, and so I just do that. Yeah, I'd, I'd spend the majority of my time sort of chilling, but it also allows me freedom to think about next projects. I still have I do some investing and stuff like that, and self education. So I spend like some of my time doing that. But yeah, I have a, just a good sort of work life balance, in my opinion. The, the the amount I like. I am a recluse. I hide in like. I say I hide in the background. I don't want all this sort of 
we want to be in the limelight all the time. Like I just want to chill, go about my life and enjoy it, do you know what I mean? But still do something meaningful and big. And I felt like I did that with, with Science for Sport and I feel like it will it will continue to, to do that. And in my next project, we'll do that as well. Um, but I, I just love chatting with entrepreneurs and stuff like that. So I, I'm actually like... If anyone is interested, probably not, but if anyone's interested and they do want to chat to me, I'm happy to put my little Calendly <laughs> link free of charge. You just jump on and chat for 30 minutes. I'm happy to chat about the business and all that. I just like connecting with hungry, interested entrepreneurs around the world and hearing what they're doing, hearing about their businesses and stuff like that. So I'll give you my little Calendly link. People can book in for like a 30 minute chat. If it's, yeah. it's just, I enjoy it. Do you know what I mean? Entrepreneurship, business. Um, it's just a challenge, you know, and I'm a former wannabe athlete and we just like that challenge. So um, I think that's probably where the passion comes from. So I'm keen to chat to anyone if they want to chat. But yeah, you, you don't find me on most things. You will find me on LinkedIn, but I don't really use it. And so everything else, I just stay quiet because it keeps my motorway, my highway free. If I've got too many cars in my motorway and everybody wants to talk to me, want mm. time and email me and message me. It's like, I can't focus on my task. And the other good one as well, the goal is to keep the goal the goal. One of my lecturers at uni told me that. I thought it was brilliant. So whatever your goal is, keep that goal the goal and go for that. Nice. So it might be dangerous putting your Canly link in the description, but we're going to put it there anyway. We'll, <laughs> we'll see what any happens. Any advice yeah. to chat to you about any kind of entrepreneurship? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm not talking about your sick dog. Yeah, no offense. It's just it's too much time for me. <laughs> fair enough but i mean if not people can actually check out scienceforsport.com and they can kind of see what owen's built there um i think the site's being restructured at the moment so i don't know when that gets launched but if you when this episode comes out if you head there it'll still be the old website so you can kind of see what's happening there and anything else and thanks for coming on i really appreciate it owen no no problem at all thanks for having me on mate um the last Say the five years we had you with, it's been an absolute pleasure, mate. So you're a gun at what you do. You're obviously killing it now and, and what you're doing here. So I'm pleased to see it's going well. I hope you enjoy Texas with those massive mosquitoes. But yeah, all good. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Massive mosquitoes and massive barbecue. Yeah. Oh, we don't mind that though, do we? We do like that. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you're listening. Until the next episode... Goodbye.